What is going on, investors? Hopefully, you guys are doing well out there. Time for the top 10 value stocks here on the Investor Channel. We're going to look at 10 different stocks, which I believe are great value based on their somewhat below average market multiple when it comes to its price to earnings. But more importantly than that, all of these companies have beat the S&P 500 in terms of total return over the last five years. It makes no sense to buy a low PE stock or a low multiple stock if it can't beat the broader market. I'd rather pay a higher multiple for a stock that can beat the S&P 500. But all of these stocks not only beat the S&P 500, but also do it with a below average market multiple on their price to earnings. Number one stock that we're going to look at is Lowe's company, ticker symbol L-O-W. Over the last year, the stock is down 11%, just a 15 forward price to earnings on this one. This stock does report earnings later this week. You've got $129 billion market cap on this one. And then when we look at the total return of this company over the last five years, Lowe's is up 189% over the last five years. The S&P 500 is just up 70%. So this this company is not only beating the market, but it's doing it handily and you're not paying a premium for the stock price. Now, when we look at forward revenue estimates on Lowe's and really all most of these companies is you're looking at companies with very slow revenue growth. Okay. You're talking about kind of low single digit revenue growth, but what these companies do is they do such a good job running their businesses. They drive efficiencies every single year. You notice there are analysts that are projecting like double digit earnings growth. So here's your EPS growth over at Lowe's. This is on a yearly view. You're looking at nearly double digit revenue growth or earnings growth over the next several years. That is why this company continues to outperform the index. Now, when you come over here and look at their most recent financials, you'll see over the last six months, the company had about $51.1 billion worth of revenue. You flow through all of your expenses. And what I've noticed year over year, selling general administrative was 17% of cost year over year. So even in an inflationary environment over the last year, the company's done a very nice job keeping their expenses the same percentage of the revenue year over year. So you flow all the way down to your net earnings at this company and you churned out about a 10% operating profit at nearly $5.3 billion last year, basically the same. But what has grown year over year is look at your cash dividends per share from $1.40 last year all the way up to $1.85. When you come over here to the dividend history of Lowe's, you notice obviously this company has been paying dividends for a long time. And what you also notice is every year you get get an increase. Last year, you were getting 80 cents per quarter. Now you're getting a dollar five. You'll get that for another two quarters and then they'll raise it again. The other thing that you're getting over at Lowe's is a massive share buyback as well. Every quarter for the last several quarters, this company has bought back over 2 billion. And in some cases over the last three quarters, over $4 billion worth of stock at Lowe's. And so you're getting a below average multiple on those earnings. You're getting a rising dividend. And on top of that, the company is buying back the shares to the tune of over $4 billion a quarter. This is why the stock is up so much compared to the S&P 500 over the last five years. Next stock that we have on our list is a Merck and company ticker symbol MRK. Over the last year, this stock is actually a big up 21%. Certainly when you compare that to other stocks and the broader market, that is a huge gain. You have just a 13.28 forward price to earnings ratio on this one. You've got a market cap of about $248 billion, like most of these companies also receiving a dividend. We'll talk about that in a moment. But over the last five years, when you look at total return over at Merck, this stock is up 127% when the S&P 500 is up just about 70%. And on top of that, when you come over here to the financials, you are just seeing pretty explosive growth on that revenue side with this company over the last nine months. Notice you had $35 billion worth of revenue last year, all the way up $10 billion to $45.5 billion. What I've also noticed, the company did a nice job keeping cost in check. You flow all the way down to net income and you went from $9.2 billion worth of net income last year, all the way up to $11.5 billion. That was $4.55 
per share. When we start to look out with Merck, it, it looks like this year they probably maybe had some uh, products come to market or they had some accelerated revenue because this year, absolutely, they accelerated their revenue by over 21%, but analyst estimates are for a flat year going into next year and then maybe reaccelerate kind of into the low single digits when it comes to revenue growth. But like most of these companies, this company continues to drive efficiencies year after year, as you should see on the earning side, potentially up to double digit EPS growth year over year. And that's important when you have a company paying a cash dividend of $2.76 per year. And when you look at this dividend, it, it increases year after year. And when you look at this company's earnings and the fact that they earned this year $4.55, last year they earned $3.60. 67 cents and that's only through nine months the fact that they're only paying two dollars and 76 cents shows you that if you buy and hold this company they are just going to rapidly continue to increase this dividend over a long period of time the next stock that we have on our list is qualcomm ticker symbol q c o m over the last year this one has not been immune to the declines that we've seen in the broader chip sector down 25 percent but you have just 11 0.874 price to earnings on this one. You do have a nice dividend yield and you've got about $136 billion valuation on this one. Now, more importantly than that, over the last five years, Qualcomm is up 114% while the S&P 500 is up closer to 70%. Now, when we start to look forward with Qualcomm, the company actually had a year over year decline on its revenues, at least according to Wall Street, coming in at about $40.5 billion. Next year, we should reaccelerate that a little bit, get up to about $45 billion, and the company will hang out in that range. Similar story when it comes to earnings. You should have a decline year over year on those earnings for Qualcomm this year, but they should accelerate next year and kind of flatten out in that $11 to $12 per share range on those earnings. When we come over here to the financials, we've got full year view on Qualcomm, $44.2 billion worth of revenue. Last year, just $33 billion. Here's more impressive than that. You bolted on over $11 billion on your revenue at Qualcomm over the last year, but notice that your costs and expenses went up less than $5 billion. So your operating income really saw a nice boost from about $9.8 billion up to about $15.8 billion flow all the way down to net income. You went from $9 billion all the way up to nearly $13 billion. Folks, that's over $11.50 per share in earnings. Last year, it was closer to $8. Now, the reason why that is important is when you look at this company dividend, they are paying you $3 per share. But clearly, this is a company that generates far more than that in earnings. So as you look at the history of this dividend, it constantly is increases. And based on these earnings at Qualcomm, it will absolutely continue to go up in the future. On top of that, the company is using some of its retained earnings to buy back shares. And it's very consistently bought back several hundred million dollars worth of shares over the last several years. And actually for over the last seven or eight years, it's been a very consistent buyback of its own stock at Qualcomm. Next stock that we're going to look at is Home Depot. They also like Lowe's report earnings later this week. Over the last year, the stock's down about 16 and a half percent. We got a little bit higher price to earnings ratio on this one than the other stocks, but I'm going to show you some things that it's probably warranted at this company. You got about a 19 forward price to earnings on this one. You got a nice 2.4 percent dividend yield. We'll talk more about the dividend here in a minute. And he got about $322 billion market cap at Home Depot. Now, here's where things get exciting. Over the last five years, total return at Home Depot up over 107%, while the S&P 500 is up just 69%. Now, when it comes to revenue growth for the upcoming years, Wall Street expecting just very steady kind of single digit growth over at this company, certainly with the real estate and housing being under a little bit of pressure, probably will put a little pressure on Home Depot to deliver these types of revenue numbers year over year, but they're insulated a little bit because obviously you have the DIY market and people improving existing homes. Now, where things get exciting, with Home Depot is they're going to continue to accelerate their earnings growth. And I'll show you their financials here in a minute. Very similar to like a lot of these companies, they do a very nice job of maintaining costs and expenses. Even in this inflationary environment, you're looking at EPS growth kind of in that mid single digits and some analysts expecting sometime in the back half of 26, 27, maybe double digit growth on that EPS side. Now, when you come over here to the company's financials, we've got a six month view. And what I noticed right off of the top, 
shop at Home Depot is you had your net sales year over year on a six month basis go up 5.2%. You flow down through all the expenses and everything, taxes, income, and you get net earnings up almost equally up about 5% from about 9 billion all the way up to $9.4 billion. So like many of these companies, as they grow these revenues, even though it's kind of like a low single digit, they tend to transfer that down all the way to earnings. Not a lot of this gets chewed up in the expenses. They do a nice job controlling those. You get down to the basic earnings per share and you're looking at a 917 per share. And when you come over here and look at the quarterly dividend rate on this one, it's sitting at about $1.90. Last year is $1.65 and so on. This company aggressively raises its dividend every single year. It's one of the benefits of holding this company. And then when you come over here and look at the buyback history, this company is buying back tens of billions of dollars worth of Home Depot shares every single year for really the last 10 years since 2013. They've bought back over $102 billion worth of Home Depot stock. That's certainly contributing to the fact that this company is beating the S&P 500 in terms of performance. The next company that we've got on our list is AbV, ticker symbol ABBV. Over the last year, kind of like Merck, this one's been on fire up 32% over the last year as most other stocks in the broader market is down big. You have just a 10.85 forward price to earnings on this one. You've got a juicy near 4% yield on this one. I love this stock. And you've got a market cap of $265 billion. Now here's where things get even better is you get a juicy dividend. You've got outperformance against the broader market and most stocks this year. And on top of that, you've beat the total return of the S&P 500 over the last five years. S&P 500 up again, about 70%. Abby up over 107%. When you look out to forward revenue estimates over at Abby, very like kind of a low single digit grower on that revenue side. And though on the earnings side, a little bit higher, kind of higher single digits. That's what we're seeing across the board with these companies is while they're not really accelerating their revenue growth, their EPS or their earnings growth actually kind of outpaces that. And that is very impressive with these well-oiled machines. Coming over here to the financials at Abby over the last nine months, not explosive revenue growth. And that's what shows you, look, you can have outperformance in some of these stocks and not necessarily have this explosive revenue growth. Because notice you went from 41.3 billion up to about $43 billion. Your total operating expenses went from 28 billion up to about 30.3. So your operating income went from about 12.9. It actually went down this year, down to 12.6, flow all the way down to net earnings. And the company was benefited by the fact that they didn't have some other expenses. Last year, they had about $2.3 billion worth of other expenses. Those went down to $427 million. So despite low Lower operating income, their net income actually went up from 7.5 up to $9.4 billion. That's $5.24 per share. Last year, you're sitting closer to $4.19 per share. Reason why this is important is the fact that through nine months, they earned $5.24. We'll give them credit for maybe another two or $3 worth of earnings in the upcoming quarter. That would give you seven to $8 in earnings at AVB for a year. Notice they have an aggressive payout over at this company at over $5.64 an annual dividend. So every dollar that you put in this company, you're getting a large amount of it back in the form of a cash dividend. Now, the dividend is not going to grow as quickly because they don't quite have the headroom on those earnings. But we showed you the stock performance of this company on top of a nearly 4% dividend rate certainly has investors excited this year. Now, on top of that, while it's not an aggressive buyback schedule, this company is buying back shares and occasionally they have these larger buy buybacks to the tune of about $1.5 billion in the first quarter. But typically you're looking at, you know, 10, $20 million in buybacks on a quarterly basis from Abby. So you're getting a higher than average dividend rate. You've got a lower price to earnings ratio in, in terms of looking forward. And on top of that, you've got a share buyback. All those things add up to a winning stock. Now we've got Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. If you're comfortable investing in Taiwan, obviously there's some China risk there. You've got ticker symbol TSM. If you followed this channel, this company has spectacular financials, but over the last year, this one's down big, down 38%. You've got 11.5 
forward earnings multiple on this one. You do have a small dividend on this one as well. And you've still got a pretty massive market cap on this one at $368 billion. The exciting thing is this stock has outperformed the S&P 500 over the last five years. S&P 500 total return 69%, TSM up over 102%. When you start looking forward with TSM, it's a little bit more exciting than some of these companies as you have really strong revenue growth, 27% this year. It should shrink a little bit next year as most chip makers are a little oversupplied on that inventory side. So there'll probably be a little bit of pullback on demand and supply. And so you're only expected to grow about 7.5%, but we should see a reacceleration in the back half of maybe 23 and into 24. So you get a little bit more growth with this company on the earning side or the EPS side, similar type story. It's going to be a little bit of lumpiness, but the company obviously has a dominant position. And as you know, yes, Intel and others are trying to uh, build fab and build manufacturing capabilities in other parts of the world. But those are going to take years, if not decades, to get online. So TSM, as long as they don't get invaded by China, likely has a long runway when it comes to those types of things. Now, the financials are really small. I apologize. They think we have 2020 vision over here, but these are fantastic. Now, a lot of these are in another currency, the Taiwan currency, but we'll focus on the company has over $46 billion worth of cash. So it's a very cash-rich company. When you look at the net revenues in a quarter. You have $20.2 billion worth of revenue. Here's the most impressive thing about this company, and, and it's different than the rest of these companies on the list, is from income from operations is nearly half of their revenue. So for every dollar that comes in in revenue, almost half of it, and it's hard to even say that, flows all the way down to almost net income, okay? It's like 40, probably eight, 49% of it flows all the way down to net income. So as this company continues to grow its revenues, it's likely to continue to grow its net income and profits. When you come over here and look at the dividend rate, it's not that impressive, just a 1.8% yield, but you're getting kind of annual increases on that dividend. It just gives you maybe a small margin of savings safety when it comes to TSM. The next stock that we're going to look at is certainly outperformed all of the market this year over the last year. Chevron Corporation, ticker symbol CVX, is up just 61% over the last year. And you still have a forward price to earnings ratio of just 9.75 on this one. You've got an over 3% yield and a $360 billion market cap. When it comes to total return over the last five years, Chevron is outpacing the S&P 500 to the tune of 102% growth versus 69% for the S&P 500. When we start to look forward with Chevron, the situation may be a little bit more murky than the rest of these companies. Obviously, you have this explosive revenue growth this year, over 46%. But that comes on the back half of 2021, where there was basically no demand for oil and gas. And you had this massive reopening of economies here in the United States and around the world and in China. And so obviously it had this large surge in demand for gasoline. As you start to look out, analysts are actually expecting that demand to kind of flatten out and go down a little bit, but you're still going to generate solid earnings. Obviously you've got explosive earnings and politicians have kind of been keying in on this, but the full story is we when you start to look out into for future years, it's likely going to normalize and actually go down in subsequent quarters. Now, when you come over here and look at this company's financials, they're going to look spectacular because again, you're comping against a 2021 where there was still parts of the economy that were shut down. You had over $189 billion worth of revenue versus $114 billion last year. You had $149 billion worth of costs and that gave you net income of $29 billion in the most recent recent nine month period last year, it was a third of that at just $10.6 billion. So year over year, your EPS, your revenue, your operating profits are just looking explosive. But the thing to understand about Chevron is this is likely going to flatten out, if not decline just a little bit in subsequent years. Now they are going to back you up. And the fact that they're paying you $5 and 68 cents in an annual dividend, that's a 3% yield. And you get consistent dividend raises on this company, like most of these companies that are paying dividends. On top of that, it's a little bit lumpy in terms of its buyback. Obviously, they had some rough patches and they have to do some investments over at Chevron. So sometimes they're actually issuing shares to raise some capitals for exploration and whatever they might be doing. But if times stay good, they should be coupling that 
with a buyback as well. Moving on to Google. Now, from a price to earnings basis, this one's going to look quote unquote expensive as you've got a forward price to earnings on this one at 20. But I think we all understand the ad market is under pressure a little bit. And if you believe that sometime next year, maybe the back half of 2023, things will start getting a little bit better. Online advertising will come back. And on top of that, Google's number one competitor when it comes to online advertising is out in the metaverse and kind of focusing on that. Well, it could be a great opportunity for Google. Now, we don't have a dividend at Google, but we have one of the largest buybacks you will ever see. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, in terms of total performance at Google, up 88% over the last five years, the S&P 500 is up closer to 70%. Now, in terms of that price to earnings ratio. I talked about how it's a little bit higher compared to maybe the broader market and certainly some of these other stocks that we're looking at. But Google compared to itself really from a price to earnings basis has never been cheaper. And that is for good reason. As you look at this company, its revenue growth has started to slow. It used to grow kind of mid teens, even during the pandemic, it would grow kind of 20, 30, 40%. We have seen a slowdown, but you are still getting like near double digit revenue growth for this company. And that's certainly puts it apart of almost all of these stocks. None of these stocks have near double digit revenue growth out into the future. Google still projecting that. And then when you come over here to the earning side, you're looking at like a mid teens grower on the earning side. And so that is why you might have to pay a little bit more for that price to earnings. And on top of that, Google's business has been under fire as I think we're in a recession here in the United States. I don't think I know we're in a recession here in the United States, and that's likely to play out over the next several quarters. Now, when we look at this company, company's financials, it doesn't get much better than this. You had $69 billion worth of revenue in a rough economic environment, and you printed about $17.1 billion of operating income. Now, last year, it was better on lower income. So you had $65 billion worth of revenue, but you had $21 billion of income from operations on a quarterly basis. As we know, these companies are starting to pull back on spending, pull back on those unprofitable business. That is going to take some time to work through the system. I think as we sit here a year from now, Google is going to be printing higher operating income and higher profits to the company. Now, here's probably the most impressive thing that you'll see maybe all day, but certainly as it pertains to Google stock is over the last five years, this company has bought back tens and hundreds of billions of dollars worth of stock. Look at over the last couple of quarters, you win a $13 billion buyback, $15 billion buyback. $15 billion buyback. Guys, this is not for a year. This is every quarter. The company is buying tens of billions of dollars worth of stock every single quarter. This in lieu of a dividend, certainly good for you, the shareholder. I think they could probably have a dividend over at Google as well to make the stock even more attractive. Now, speaking of attractive, XOM is Exxon Mobil Corporation. And over the last year, this one's just up over 77%. And we still got a forward price to earnings multiple on this one at just eight. We've got a 3% dividend yield and a massive $470 billion market cap on this one. But when you see the revenues that this company generates, you'll see why. Now, the company has underperformed the S&P 500 for the vast majority over the last five years. But obviously, after exploding this year, it has overtaken the S&P 500 when it comes to total return up over 80% when the SP 500 is up closer to 70%. Now, when we come over here and look at the revenue estimates, looks very similar to Chevron. You are having an explosive revenue and earnings growth this year for ExxonMobil, but we are expected to actually decline in subsequent years. So it'll be interesting to see how this stock and this sector reacts to likely declining revenues and declining earnings year over year. We'll see if investors give this company a pass. When we come over here and look at the financials at Exxon, holy crap, for the last nine months, we've had over 318 billion. Yeah, that's a billion dollars in revenue. You had about $260 billion worth of cost. That means you printed net income of $43 billion. Obviously, that compares very favorably to last year. You're sitting closer to $14 billion. So as the politicians just hamel these oil companies understand that last year and the year before were a complete disaster and they're really just kind of making up for those lost earnings and those lost profits. Now, we come over here to dividend. This is probably why you buy this stock. You've got a 3% dividend yield on this one. Pretty consistent dividend raises, but not anything that explosive. You're looking at like maybe a penny every year or so, and they don't do it every single year. So if you're looking for a lot of revenue growth or excuse me, dividend 
dividend growth. ExxonMobil, probably not exactly the stock for you. And when it comes to buybacks, they've really poured money into that. As you see here, the five-year chart, they really just had kind of a token buyback on the books. But look at over the last three quarters, $2 billion buyback. $4 billion buyback, $4.5 billion worth of buyback. So they've really taken the earnings that they had this year at Exxon and they've just bought back the stock. And on top of that, paid a dividend. Finally, the last stock, number 10 in our list is probably the most interesting, probably the most misunderstood when it comes to an investment. And I'll explain here in a minute. We've got Berkshire Hathaway. Obviously, this is Warren Buffett's company and there's two different share classes. We'll look at the Burke.B shares. Those are trading at about $310 per share as we move through the trading day of the last year up 9%. Now, you've got a 20 forward price to earnings on this one, but I'll show you how deceptive that is and how you probably really shouldn't value this company from a price to earnings basis, and I'll show you why. Market cap sitting at $680 billion. Now, in terms of total return, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway is up 71% over the last five years, and the S&P 500 is just trailing behind it just a little bit at about 69% return. Now, when we come here and look at forward revenue estimates on this one, the street doesn't go out too far on this company, but you're expecting a very explosive 2023 where you're looking at 27% of revenue growth year over year, and on the earnings side, not actually going to translate into a lot of new earnings for the company in 2023. That's interesting. Interesting, but we should seek some lumpiness here. And I'll show you why there's some lumpiness in this company because you're actually investing in kind of two different things when it comes well, more than that, but there's really two different business models at Berkshire Hathaway. Number one is the company invests a lot of money into other pr private and public companies. So you've got public companies like American Express, Apple, Bank of America, Coca Cola. These are investments, including Chevron as well. These are investments Warren Buffett has had for a very very long time. Most of these investments are 10, 15, maybe even 20 years or more in this company to the tune of $327 billion worth of this company's assets are actually tied up into other public companies. Again, like Amex, Apple, Coca-Cola. And so when you look at this company's valuation at $683 billion, factor in that over half of that is actually stock in other companies. And so the core business at Berkshire Hathaway, which is the railroad business, Dairy Queen, the insurance business like Geico, well, that business is actually at that valued at about $300 billion. Because again, you take the total valuation of the company and then you realize that about half of that or about $350 billion of that is actually a stock in other companies. So what I like to do with Berkshire is actually look at the core business. So we've got six months here and the company actually breaks out the core business. They have insurance and then they have railroads, utilities, and energy. The insurance business generated 121, nearly $122 billion worth of business year over year. The revenues of the railroad business sitting right about $25 billion. So that business over the last six months is about $147 billion. Now we'll give them credit. The last six months are going to look very similar to the upcoming six months. So you've got a business that is doing nearly $295 billion worth of business. We'll just give it credit for $300 billion in revenue over the last year. And again, I'll remind you, sitting in the company's assets over three $327 billion worth of public company stock. And then you couple that with a core business that generates nearly $300 billion worth of revenue. You are paying about one time sales for the core business. And this is a profitable business and also growing year over year. Look at your revenues last year on the core business. Again, this is just for six months. So we're timesing these by two to kind of give us a full year view. Last year, you're at 133. Now you're up to 146. This is a growing business. Now on top of that, it's a profitable business as well. Your total cost Costs and expenses were about $127 billion for the railroad and insurance business. So you take your 146 and you minus 127, and you've got about $20 billion worth of positive income for the last six months over at Berkshire. So if you want to double that and give the company credit for about $40 billion worth of operating profits on their core business, and again, we're valuing that business right about $300 billion, that means kind of the price to earnings on that business is less than 10. Here's 
here's where the tricky thing from an accounting perspective that Berkshire gets locked up in. So their investments that is in these companies like Apple, like American Express, well, every year or every quarter, these stocks are obviously going up and down. And so the company actually has to recognize when these stocks go down, they actually have to recognize them as losses. Even though they have not sold any of these stocks, the SEC requires them to actually write down the value of those investments. So you see over the last six months, they've actually lost $69 billion on paper. This is not realized gains. This is on paper. And so when you factor in this $69 billion loss last year, obviously in 2021, every stock was just going up. Same with Berkshire Hathaway. They made on paper $33 billion. So you take your total revenues of $146 billion. You take your total cost in that business at $127 billion. Well, now you've got to write off on paper losses of $69 billion. So it's going to turn your net earnings actually negative to the tune of $37 billion. But we know that over $68 billion of that is just a paper loss. And over the vast majority of holding times of these companies, Berkshire Hathaway is up 100 and $77 billion on their investments in stock. This is one of the most undervalued companies in the stock market, probably because it's one of the most misunderstood. And when you look at the price to earnings, you look at the fact that they had negative net income, a lot of investors don't understand that this $69 billion is just a paper loss. And over the long term, the company has more than doubled their money in investments. They spent $149 billion on buying stocks like Amex, Coca-Cola, Bank of America, and Apple. And they are up $177 billion to give them a fair value of that $327 billion. Folks, those are the top 10 low price to earning stocks in this stock market. All of them beat the total return of the S&P 500. And I think all of them could be in your portfolio. Let me know down in the comments below which ones you own and which one might be on your watch list. I'd love to hear from you. We'll be back again soon with more. Good luck with your investments.